All right, welcome everybody. We are live, and I hope you're all having a good day. It's been a while since the last stream. Uh, there's a lot to talk about. Um, I've been doing more and more digging into these huge, vast stores of knowledge that are available to us, and um, there's so many of them, and they're very, very vast. Even take, for example, one uh, new kid on the block, ChatGPT. There's a ton of, of information that you could glean from using such a system. Um, but then also these huge uh, databases like the Wikimedia Commons, archive.org, this one here, Anna's Archive, um, with huge uh, repositories of PDFs, with uh, a lot of them with like decent OCR, as in you can highlight the text, copy paste the text, search through it for things. But you still find yourself if you copy and paste it to do like say a voice, uh, a text to speech, voice creation. The uh, you'll find a number of mistakes that you have to fix. But then we can always uh, pass as a step through you know the OCR through some sort of an LLM to enhance it, say, okay, uh, this is the text that we have. Maybe even give it a couple examples. Like I'm noting in here that there's, uh, one that I saw the other day was like A-N-C-L instead of the word and, A-N-D, A-N-C-L. So instead of the D, it put a C and an L. That kind of thing. If you, re if you see a pattern in the way that the OCR software that was used, which can vary from uh, document to document, then you can give that as instruction to the LLM. Or we can do this other route, which I've been exploring, which is pretty obvious, uh, using OCR ourselves. And the OCR technology has gotten so much better. So that's optical character recognition. So obviously we have a lot of characters we're trying to recognize and string together words in a way that we can get this processed and read to us and compiled, et cetera, et cetera. So this is something that I've been really exploring because I think there's this window where we still have a lot of these so-called shadow libraries that haven't been shut down, which are some of the premier ways to get a lot of documents, many of which are, by the way, uh, public domain documents, as in they're no longer copyright protected. Some of them are copyright protected, and of course I'm not advocating... Uh, breaking the law here. Although we will talk about some questionable things and um, it brings up some questions of morality. I mean, I could imagine some artists not wanting, some, excuse me, authors, not liking the idea of libraries in general, right? That's just something that society has accepted or selling used books <laughs> or um, I had another example, but you get the idea. There's there's gray areas where people have to ask themselves if it's moral or uh, immoral. So that's up for everybody to decide. But um, then again, many uh, authors love libraries and dream of having their book in a library that people can discover it that way and buy more copies or be influenced by the ideas. And the author themselves probably leveraged the fact that there were libraries to get access to more books. <laughs> so um, it's, it's very interesting. And I think it's, it's something that we should just discuss and come to a group consensus on as much as possible. But um, I'm really being, I'm really amazed recently by the language models like chat GPT, obviously huge problems with them. They're established with propaganda machines to the max. But if you have like specific questions about uh, utilizing technology for your various endeavors or an etymological question or historical question, etc. It's pretty interesting that there's a machine that the establishment has set up <laughs> um, that will give us lengthy, helpful answers to whatever we ask it. It seems obviously like a trap. I think it definitely is a trap. But it also kind of makes their official statement in a way. I don't know if you've ever tried contacting the uh, the mouthpieces of the establishment, but they don't go on the record very often 
to answer a specific question. So it's interesting to, to be able to run questions into the chat GPT and say, kind of more or less, this is the best explanation the establishment has. This is kind of the official consensus, as wrong as that might be. So I, I think there's a place for Wikipedia. I'm super glad Wikipedia exists. Every time I try to show something on Wikipedia, you know, a dozen people in the chat will say, oh, this guy looks at Wikipedia. A lot of times because they're trying to discredit uh, my video. If I'm po uh, pointing out, for example, ivermectin is a potent PGP inhibitor. And if I'm showing what PGP is, it's like a powerful, important dr uh, drug detox route. Then they'll be like, well, this none of this is valid because it's uh, being shown on Wikipedia. <laughs> it's like, yeah, no, I've looked at a, a bunch of studies and shown a bunch of studies as well. But that's beside the point. I think the more information, the better for the most part, unless it's just totally useless or worse than, worse than useless, which a lot of information is. Propaganda for the most part is, other than analyzing it as propaganda that people are consuming. <laughs> but then again, it's, it's a net negative for the whole. But um, I've got so many things to say, but uh, what I, you know, I like doing... I like using ChatGPT. One of the problems is that it will hallucinate and give subpar answers. And I found that uh, Opus 3 is actually really good for research. Uh, there, what's it called? Yeah, Opus from Anthropic. So it's good to see more competition, more variation. But what I really want to do is plug into all these millions of PDFs that we have of works that are in the public domain and I want to give them a voice, turn them into videos, maybe at least turn them into audio files because uh, I find that to be the best way to read these books or to hear these books. And uh, there's a lot of very, very interesting material out there. And I, I find the medium fascinating because having to print each page obviously is a limiting factor and the cost used to be so high that um, a lot of thought went into how can we minimize and revise this and edit it down, boil it down, which is fascinating. So we have these new tools and I'm just thinking about all the ways they can be combined to help us really glean some insight from the data. And I find that to be very, very interesting. So welcome everybody in the chat. Hopefully the sound is coming through. Shout out to Tess. Good to see everybody. Make sure everything's fired up. So um, look at this. This came across my screen. So if you remember in the last stream, I was talking about how Anna's archive is really good if you have an ID because their search functionality only shows you 100 results. Well, a couple big updates on that front. Let me actually pull up Anna's archive. What's amazing now is it shows all the pages of search results. So they fixed that issue. Uh, one issue that I run into is I um, max out the amount that I'm allowed to download. And so I have to let it cool off a little bit and download some more. So uh, they do put a sort of a paywall in terms of making us wait a little bit longer for the downloads and not being able to do as many downloads unless you're a member, which is tricky because they, they don't have like payment processor. <laughs> so, uh, there's an option to send them an Amazon gift card in the specified amount, but I'm worried about that shutting down my Amazon account or something. <laughs> I'm paranoid about that. But um, what's amazing now is they have this at the bottom. Although it's kind of strange that a search for etymology would only yield two pages. Did I spell it wrong? No. So that's strange because you'll get more on like Wikimedia Commons. which is another great option. This might be the most easy to use. Also, I found uh, the Library of Congress has some interesting books that you can just download. But I find it kind of limiting to look at, especially on my screen, PDFs with like white pages and black font. It's, it's great when it's in printed format and you can actually like fold it out on your desk. So this will tell us at least which books to buy for that. But for me, a lot of this, I want to, ha I want to have it read to me. And um, I already have made a lot of progress when it comes to text-to-speech stuff. Plug it into, for example, the best one that I found 
well, not the best in terms of quality, but price-wise, is Google Voice. Uh, it's a Google Cloud offering. And I think you get like a couple hundred dollars free when you sign up. I could be wrong about that. I'm not trying to push Google's products at all. But what's interesting is with uh, Google's Voice... You get a certain number every month of free characters that they, I think, price by the character, essentially. I'm trying to find it. Not Go it's not Google Voice. It's a uh, Google Text-to-Speech, maybe. And uh, to date, I've only spent like 32 cents. It's been multiple months. But I'm trying to show you the pricing. Not that it really matters. Yeah, no, screw that. It, it turns out to be pretty cheap unless you start hitting huge volumes with like their, their highest quality voice. And it also opens the possibility for us to kind of cycle through the different voices. But for example, um, I was thinking about, I put it on the thumbnail for the video today. You've been locked up here for years with the regular damned Tower of Babel. That's a quote from Fahrenheit 451. That's the government censor trying to kind of justify there's some other segments in that book as well that are super interesting where the the firefighters the people who come and burn the books justify like why the books are of no value why they're better off destroyed that it's just janitorial work just cleaning up um but I, that line is so interesting because it, it's a world where they have no information at all practically um and some people try to smuggle some information and the censors come in and they basically play God, literally. And they invoke the Bible and they say, well, look, obviously God wants everybody ignorant and dumb. And so if anybody has any information, it's akin to the Tower of Babel. And so that, that comes to mind. I think that's really interesting for Ray Bradbury and his anti-censorship book to, uh, to have the censor invoke that story. So um, I've been thinking about that. And so, for example, I was just kind of Going back and forth with uh, my web page here. Let me just show AI help. And I do intend to put this out there and open source it. Um, it's just taking me a bit longer because I got sidetracked with the code development stuff, which I'm still going to push ahead, but I like to just mix it up and, and pursue new grounds to teach, especially. And I think we accomplished that and... Uh, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna still kick. I'm going to still kick that around, but I want to get back to archiving and research in mass, just like huge bulk research jobs, downloading huge numbers of books, packaging them up, distributing huge numbers of out of out of copyright books. Something I want to do, but uh, for example, I can ask it here: What is the gossip protocol? And I realized in the last stream, I gave the wrong etymology for the word gossip. I think I, I got it confused with gospel. Gossip is different, which, it's, which uh, reminds me. Um, this is one of my goals is to be able to uh, pull up for an English word like gossip, a huge array of all these different entries from all these like really classic dictionaries and etymology dictionaries and just see them all at all up at once which is something that i always dreamt of doing to look at a single word at a time if it's a really fascinating word and you'd have to pull up all the all your books back in the old days a couple years ago you'd have to you'd have to open up all your dictionaries to the page for that entry and then go through and compare them but now with ocr we can actually automate that and have it done automatically so that we just click on the word and see all the entries. That's what I'm going for. One of the things. But um, what is the gossip protocol? Because I don't think I did a great job explaining the gossip protocol. Let me just use this prompt I already sent off. Using the gossip protocol as an analog, explain the importance of creating persuasive viral informational videos to truly inform the world of crucial facts.
Information spreads in a decentralized manner, similar to how gossip spreads among people, ensuring that all nodes, so the different people or the different computers, eventually receive the message. Each share on social networks is akin to a node passing the information to another. And then it becomes really important how much do people share with each other? How much do people talk? Which is interesting also because that's what the Tower of Babel talks about, amongst other things. It's a very interesting story because it's talking about literally trying to ascend to the heavens and to play God and to uh, step into the, you know, try to step into the shoes of a God and along the way being very evil and using language as a technology of evil. So there's a lot of parts there and, and there's a lot of humans amongst us doing these things, which could bode badly, definitely. But um, what's interesting is how the tyrants, like in the book Fahrenheit 451, will draw comparisons and be like, well, you, you shouldn't have information. You guys should not be able to collaborate with everybody around the world because that's like the Tower of Babel. We need everybody segmented, compartmentalized, and don't talk to each other. So it's interesting to me, mythology, uh, such as this other story that came up, one of the things I was going to mention, is I was just asking about the Tower of Babel to get some information about what uh, the source documents say on it, etc. And it mentioned this ancient Greek mythology of the Titans. And it said something about the Titans building a tower to reach the gods, which is a little bit of a misquote, but it got me interested. I'm like, oh, I didn't know there was a analog story in Greek mythology. So you get, you get these little threads that you can continue on and follow up on. So I did a follow up here and there was a bit of a discrepancy, although I admit that it's a little bit of a wrong question because they weren't building a tower per se. They were like, desperately trying to reach Mount Olympus to reach the gods and kill them, as the story goes. And um, it was more of like a way to ascend. But that's also kind of what the Tower of Babel was about. So let me just play a little bit of this. Certainly. Let me dive deeper into the details and context surrounding the myth of the Titan. Hesiod's Theogony and the fragmentary works of the poet Aeschylus. Certainly, let me dive deeper into the details and context surrounding the myth of the Titans building a tower to Olympus, primary sources and variations. The primary ancient Greek sources that recount this myth include Hesiod's Theogony and the fragmentary works of the poet Aeschylus. However, the details vary between these sources. Hesiod describes the Titans attempting to reach the heavens by piling mountains on top of one another, while Aeschylus suggests they built an actual tower. Later sources, such as Ovid's Metamorphoses, also reference this myth but with some additional embellishments. The Titanomachy and broader context. This myth is closely tied to the Titanomachy, the epic war between the Titans and the Olympian gods led by Zeus. The Titans' attempt to build a tower to Olympus can be seen as a direct challenge to the authority and dominion of the Olympian gods. It represents the Titans' hubris and ambition to overthrow the ruling deities. Parallels in other mythologies. There are some parallels between this myth and the story of the Tower of Babel in the Book of Genesis. So I found that very interesting, and that was something I just learned walking around today. You know, having thoughts about that. Uh, I think people think a lot. Uh, people think a lot about the Tower of Babel and its significance and what it means. I think it's a little bit crazy that we have like an explanation handed to us about, oh, this is why God did it. <laughs> Which uh, after, if the story is true, it seems like kind of a crazy thing to do is to speak for God and to say, and to ascribe motives. Especially if, if you're speaking for God and say, well, it's because you had some books and you were learning. <laughs> um, but that's beside the point. So it's, I just wanted to bring it up because I find it to be very um, thought-provoking and interesting. And one of the things that one could research is uh, these old documents, such as the, the histories there. And those people were pre-Ovid. So that means that they were like uh, turn of the millennia and early, or, uh, earlier. So it's very interesting how much we have to pour through to try to make sense and to just explore fascinating topics. And um, maybe this won't get censored into the future, although it's crazy that we live in a time where 
people are being arrested for running shadow libraries. I think that's what's happened to two people who were part of the group that uh, was the predecessor to Anna's archive. And they're awaiting sentencing or something. This happened a few months ago, maybe? I'm not sure. I need to get caught up with the story. But to me, that's a bigger uh, attack on human knowledge than Assange, which you know everyone just talks about uh, all the time. And I'm obviously for Assange to be free. But to me, this is a way more important project than uh, WikiLeaks. All right, so in the last show, we were talking about how can we download the most important books for our certain research topic? And it was harder before. It's still not perfectly solved here. Uh, it was harder, though, even before when it would only give us 100 results. In no way to go to the secondary and tertiary pages. But the problem here that I'm seeing is it only gives me two pages of results for etymology. So I think we can do better than this. And I think it could do better than this. I bet you I could find a list of a bunch of books that should come up. And if we search them by ID, they would come up hopefully. But what I'm trying to do is compile a list of the books that I'm trying to hunt down, especially the out of copyright stuff, because I can republish, republish that. I can compile big collections, you know, like here's the history collection. Here's a bunch of really interesting documents about the Bible. Here's a bunch of really interesting documents about uh, ancient Aryans and Proto-Indo-European. And I have a huge one in the works for just etymology centered around the English language and its uh, roots. So um, I find it thrilling how much data we have to pour through. But we need to use all the tools that we have. And it wouldn't even be possible without computers, frankly. I mean, we'd be able to kind of uh, start trying to <laughs> empty a, a, a bathtub with a spoon, so to speak. Um, it'd be very inefficient. We'd probably never finish. But we don't, I mean, we're, we're still, not, still not going to finish, even with all these crazy tools that we have. But I want to go through some of my ideas here. So there is uh, this right here. It's called Open Library. And it's pretty good. You can download the works and the authors, and I've done that. And uh, for the works, it's a big list of uh, JSON, one JSON per row, per line, excuse me. And... Um, you can get things like the title and the author ID. Then in the author's dump here, you can look up who that author is. But you've uh, pretty much ha you pretty much have to use databases. Well, I shouldn't say have to. That's definitely the the best way to tackle this, is with uh, databases. And if anybody needs some code on that, I've, I just wrote some. So here's what here's what we have. There would be a lot of uh, entries. Let me actually go to this one first before we go into that database. Uh, this is amazing. So the 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 team at Anna's blog managed to scrape 1.3 billion WorldCat library records, of which I think 700 million of them were. Um, like unique actual books. So this is a diagram, which I think if you put it next to the WorldCat data would be a dwarfed. But you can see that there's not really a consensus between these different uh, databases. There's ISBN database, Open Library, and Z Library. And uh, each of them have some that the others don't have. And so this blog post is pretty interesting. So uh, enters WorldCat into the scopes here of this team. It's a proprietary database by OCLC, which aggregates metadata records from libraries all over the world. 
in exchange for giving those libraries access to the full data set. So um, it took them about a year, but they meticulously scraped all of their records. And they uh, exploited some uh, open doors with, uh, that came along with the website redesign. But essentially, it sounds like it just wasn't like banning people for using bots. Like they just they just went to each of the pages and uh, got some basic information. But it's amazing how many books they have because it's thirty thousand libraries, thirty thousand libraries, and the combined list of all their books. So. Um, Certainly, there's books that aren't going to be on the list, a lot of them, but that's that's huge. It's a huge list. And so the question is, like, do people think it's wrong to download this? I'm sure there's a lot of people that do think it's wrong. And it's just a list of books. This is where we've, you know, found ourselves. So they uh, are distributing this as a torrent. 220 gigabytes compressed, but that uses Z standard compression. So it comes out to being 2.2 terabytes uncompressed. And so they have 700 million unique actual records in there. So in comparison, Open, Li Open Library has 47 million records. And so this one is somewhat manageable, but it's still a, little, a bit of a challenge to get what you need from it. I'll show you what I did. So we can see in here the information they're collecting. So if I copy this, for example, this is for a database called, or for a, a book in their database called Pride and Prejudice and Zombies. It's like a parody of Jane Austen. But you can see all this information that is available, all these IDs, descriptions, summaries. And by the way, it does not sound like WorldCat is happy that this information's out. But it's it's kind of interesting to see this uh, unfold. And this was released, by the way, about five months ago. There's notes in here about the OCLC uh, team. They say at the end, we do want to give a genuine shout out to the WorldCat team. Even though it was a small tragedy that your data was locked up, you did an amazing job at getting 30,000 libraries on board to share their metadata with you. As with many of our releases, we could not have done it without the decades of hard work you put into building the collections that we now liberate. So I find this to be a fascinating development as people are putting huge amounts, what amounts to a treasure trove of information huge amounts of books and reference material into the public sphere, if not the public domain. So um, this gives us a list if you were to want to tap into this, which I'm not advocating. I don't know if I'm going to or not. Um, it seems silly for them to really crack down on researchers trying to get a list of books. I can see why they'd be upset with uh, the people who are publishing it. Although still, it's not going to hurt their ability to get more libraries on board, do their do their business. Okay, but um, very interesting because this gives us a list where we could find IDs, find just the the existence of a book because it is being circulated somewhere. Oh, there's a book called. The Secret History of Etymology by so-and-so. Well, I've got to go try to track that book down. And so it creates, like they say here, a to-do list of books that need to be preserved. So that's another interesting puzzle piece here. Wikimedia Commons is one of the easiest to use. For example, I can just search here etymology. Then other media. And so this puts Anna's archive to shame 
17,121 results. Which, um, the other one had like 200. So I'm just trying to think of these different parts, uh, different pieces that we have. Huge amounts of information that we can uh, sift through. Especially if we have a topic in mind, that's what I'm most interested in. Um, and LLMs are interesting for fact finding and, and trying to find interesting threads for us to pursue. But I think it's it's way more interesting and useful because you can actually like cite it and uh, you're going to have to do this step anyway if you find something interesting on ChatGPT. You're going to have to go validate it. You you should. Uh, it's and also also if we find something in a book that doesn't mean it's true, but we can cite it to the book and say this is like a, a predominant authority in this. I don't like the appeal to authority, but it's like this person said this in in this book that everybody cites, and uh, take that for what it's worth. I think that holds more weight. Maybe it shouldn't. <laughs> Maybe this will change. But saying, "Oh, ChatGPT told me," or "I heard it in a video," which, by the way, I do think it's important for us to back up videos. There's a lot of good information in, in videos. There's a lot of crap information, but that applies to books as well. Um, and also, we should package the information that we find in books in the new video medium, in an audio. And um, even music as a medium. So, uh, Hathi Trust is another interesting source that you can look at. So, what I try to do with the open library data to finish, to go along with the story, I wanted to start whittling it down to the topic that I'm interested in, which might change from run to run. Maybe I want to look into Greek mythology next. Um, so basically we have this huge list of documents. I forgot how many. After I did all my sorting and filtering, I ended up with 225,000. That's this list right here. And what I, what I decided on is let me... Uh, put a list of keywords that will include entries. And then I also want a list that will exclude entries. And I want to have a list for the titles, include and exclude, and a list for the subjects, include and exclude by subject. So that works pretty well. Um, it casted a very wide net, which is what I was looking for. But it might be a little bit too wide because there's a lot of stuff in here that I don't really need. But this approach would work for anything we wanted to research. So then I just drop this into a, a database. Let me open this up. And so what's a little bit frustrating is that it takes a long time to, do, to run um, an AI job for each of 225,000 records. So I'm rethinking if that's even the approach I want to do. But that was one of the first things I tried. I, with the help of uh, ChatGPT, I came up with a rubric uh, to rate 1 through 10. Although now I'm seeing, um, I probably want to rework this <laughs> rubric. I wasn't even thinking about it because a lot of times it would give me a result like, oh, we scored a four to five. And I'm like, oh, I was hoping you'd just give me a single number. <laughs> but I bet you if I didn't put it like uh, the way I worded it here, if I just said one, two, three, four, five, that it would uh, more likely decide on a single number. Especially because this covers a broad spectrum of different uh, possibilities. But the idea is that anything that's tagged here with AI run this prompt, it will use the model that's specified. This, by the way, Databricks is the new uh, model that just dropped. Let me find it here. Open router.
Oh, sorry, I'm on mute. I'll try to fix that in the uh, post-production. But, um, sorry, I've been talking over here. So this is the database right here. So I have it marked to run each of my prompts using uh, Databricks. And that's the new open source database. Uh, I was showing that here. It's about six times more expensive than a uh, mixtral eight times seven B. So there's a trade off there, but it seems to be better. And uh, sorry about the sound issue. So I have this, uh, this prompt. I don't know if I already said this. I'll, I'll be brief this time, which basically says, evaluate this book for me using this rubric. One is entirely irrelevant. Two to three is slightly relevant, four to five moderately relevant, et cetera, et cetera. And I'm realizing now I probably should have just said one, two, three, four, and five and six because um, it gets confused and it gives me back a range which is hard to parse out, which I can show you here. So I'm building these uh, components, which I'm, I, I think anybody who's actually delved into this uh, field would agree this is uh, crucial. There's the prompt. Then you get the response back. You have to parse the response and get the key uh, piece of information. So granted, in this example, my prompt wasn't very good. I wasn't very explicit because I, I kind of wanted to play around with uh, making a parser. But I could have said, you must start your response immediately with the rating before any explanation. But I think um, just letting it do its thing and being flexible might yield the best result. And uh, I, it's kind of a gut feeling at this point, but... It's kind of interesting how these uh, next, uh, how they how they uh, build the strings out using these models. In a lot of cases, I don't know. As you get more and more proprietary, it gets uh, different. But the mathematics behind it, it's token by token generation based on probabilities. So you set up the stage with your question, of all these tokens in a row, and then it tries to guess the next tokens. And it just generates a series of tokens based on its training. So um, it's kind of this entirely new field that a lot of people don't know how to think about it, myself included. But it's very important how to design these prompts and prompt and uh, parse them. And I think that those two pieces go hand in hand and you have to have a strategy that makes sense um, for the pairing. But for example, I have this page I just spun up and I have this one that we, uh, we already talked about the other day that allows me to build parsers and try them on on a bunch of different models and then cache the results so that um, I can improve the queries later and keep testing them, which maybe I should have done for this example, except for I already had a huge list of ratings that were pouring in. So I just needed, while it was still running through these 225,000 records, it's only like 2% done. And I might just kill the operation at, at a certain point take the gems that it found and go about this a different way. Oh, that's the other thing I was going to mention before we get into the parsers. The other way to get the key uh, documents to download, the key books to download that we want is to do a bulk job. Excuse me, not a bulk job, but that's what I was already doing here. A bulk job, bulk AI job just means do this for each row essentially, or for certain rows pull in some more information running a query, or excuse me, a, a prompt, for example, on ChatGPT. But then there's the uh, boil down. And then uh, for this one, for this application, what I would do is maybe give it 10 at a time and then say, uh, select the top. Actually, or maybe I would just say, give me back an order list I would order them one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, with it very clear what the number is for each book. And I would say, like, simply return a numbered list, a list of numbers, comma separated. For example, two, three, one. I'd give it an example, and um, and then I tell it what I wanted to rate it based on, 
And so I could probably summarize this a lot more, not have to do as long of a prompt. I was just playing around here with thinking about how to do this. But I think if, if that was effective, if somehow I could choose five using some sort of a rating all at once, 10 by 10, and then keep whittle, whittling it down 50% at a time, I'd have to run the numbers how many rounds that would take, but presumably you could get to the cream of the crop. And also, uh, you could analyze the uh, results from each run too to see if you got any stragglers that were inappropriately lo uh, lost in the mix. Or just as a sanity check to, to evaluate the method. You can see at each step, okay, this is the list of 10, and then here are the five that were selected. And then for, so for each of those steps, we need a parser to get us the five of the 10 that we should pass along. It's probably not enough to trust it to, uh, well, yeah, you'd have to do that because then you have to normalize it again. So you know which items you're actually talking about. So the parsers are key is my point. And so we need a couple of ways to design them and they can be written in a number, a number of different languages. Uh, you could have a PHP parser. You could have a JavaScript parser. A lot of my uh, parsers are JavaScript parsers. And it's also pretty trivial uh, to translate the two. If you have a parser in one language, you can translate it to another a lot of times pretty easily. And a parser just means that we're grabbing small pieces of, of information from a longer string. And so I'm kind of building up my collection of parsers. Here's the new page I built just for this one. Actually, it's going to be for any any parser that I need that I have a big list of uh, data to help me perfect. But uh, basically, I can try it over and over again and update. And I did this uh, maybe six or seven times with the help of ChatGPT to flesh it out. And then I'd say, well, that's pretty good, but it messed up on this one. And so I can scroll through. I think it messed up on one here, but it's a weird one. And I don't even care. <laughs> Uh, this is very confusing how this was returned. But I got all the other ones. You can see the expected versus the actual. So I can just keep building out my parser collection, my prompt collection, and uh, applying it. So one, one thing that we need is how do we take a list of books, be it 700 million books, or what was the uh, open library? Forty seven million. So how do we take that and then find the books that we really want to research? And I'm totally fine with buying books to add to my collection. I'm not like pro piracy just for the hell of it for me it's like we need to we need to uh learn and figure out this information and use things like libraries and buy books but which books do we do we buy you know so uh, uh i think i think it's good that there are people who are archiving this stuff and I probably would never engage in like widespread transmission of uh, so-called copyrighted material like they are. But I will, for example, uh, try to make it way more accessible and easy for people to download out of copyright stuff. Really, really old reference material. And I think that's fascinating and it gets people into the topics and people can uh, track down these other books. But my question that I'm trying to solve here is how do we systematically identify the books that we want to track down? Because it's really amazed me as I continue to dig, I was kind of hoping for maybe a handful of books that I was picturing about, you know, understanding language better. But there's got to be some books doing this. And then I'd find one or two, <laughs> and then that turned into a few dozen and then a few hundred, and it just keeps going. And sometimes it's it's uh, 
feels like I'm always in acquisition mode, trying to find more and more PDFs to download when there's a lot that we need to process. But I do feel safer once it is on one of my hard drives. Then I can be like, okay, well, even if that website goes down, we have it. There's a time, I guess, to reap and to sow. But um, I'm also trying to develop the pipeline and the technology to get this into a more usable form like text-to-speech, for example. I think it's a great example. And also uh, try to turn it into reports, more useful reports, summarizations, that then people can delve into if they're interested. Like, what do we do when we go to a library? Well, you peruse the shelves, trying to see if there's any books that uh, speak to you that are interesting. Then you kind of open up the book and you see, okay, is this going to be useful or not? Then you only really sit down with the book if you've identified that it's helpful and useful. So how can we, you know, expedite the process of <laughs> going through the whole library book by book? Keep it in mind that that's just one library and a very small sliver of the total books in existence. I think it's amazing that we have these new tools that can help us uh, through this method I just described, boil down our lists, just keep cutting them in half, take the five best examples here. But then you get into some issues where what if a list has all 10 great books and another list has zero? <laughs> Wouldn't you want to take all the great books from the 10? And uh, But then the, the benefit of doing it this way is the saved cost using the LLM. So it's cheaper, gets the job done quicker, but there's, you know, not as much consistency, not as much accuracy as going one by one saying, give me a rating one through five using this rubric. It's an interesting problem to think about. We have so many more uh, tools that people don't even know how they work at this point. I've been using them obsessively for the past five months, it seems, four months. And um, there's still a lot of question marks, which is good. It's an entirely new field, and they're trying to uh, lock down the information for the big time. But, um, I, you know, my hunch is that the answer is to turn to the old, the old books in scientific papers with, you know, discernment. That's my hunch. But I do think that ChatGPT can help us real quick get threads to pull on and then turn to the old books. And also hear out ChatGPT if it, if it uh, take it to the boundary of where it'll take you. But then at a certain point, we have to hop off and uh, not be contained. So, what was I going to show? So, it's it's a daunting task, but I am interested in what books are, you know, are in this huge list. Because I know that there's a bunch more. I know that there's a ton more books. Like, really, really fascinating books, and that's what all of these, I mean, for the most part, that's what's being uh, consolidated and recollected by ChatGPT and the like with this crazy lens that they, they want to put on it. So I'm just really uh, trying to back up some more stuff and see what we can do as far as processing it and making it more accessible. Because I, I really want to just start ha like hearing these books. But um, there's a, a couple of transformations that have to happen to make it sound really good. So that's what I'm working on. But it, it is key if we have a big list of 700 million books that we have uh, databases that can hold all the matches that we want in some way to sift through those matches or to have a, a really robust... <laughs> I mean, it's, it's a very hard problem to solve. Oh, let me show you the data that uh, this one library has. 
Open Library ha it does also have a list of subjects, as I showed, that I leveraged. And then I also on the right, I put all the uh, most seen subjects in our search results here that have not been addressed. So I might want to add some of these actually Greek language, Hebrew langu language, vocabulary. Just gives me ideas. But then also this WorldCat database Shout out to ARAM in the chat, good to see you. If I go here, it also has subjects. Look at how many subjects this one has. I mean, these are pretty specific actually. But the idea is that you just iterate through the 700 million and anytime you find one that's of interest, log it somewhere else to a, a different place or to a database. But I am very interested in coming up with a list of documents, especially the out of copyright documents, to hunt down. And then to try to package them up for people to download in mass. Because it's it's kind of like a huge relay race that we have to run. And with the help of technology, we can skip huge steps with shortcuts. So it's, if one person just takes the time and really... Uh, diligently goes through a bunch of different uh, vast <laughs> collection of databases with lots of duplication and like any time that somebody spends doing research saves the next round of researchers who can all just leverage th the time that was saved so um that's my hope and we have a lot of great uh, code that i'm still looking to release here soon and i have a lot of um a ton of books that I've been coming across and saving up. Almost an overwhelming amount. And frankly, it makes all the silly stuff on social media that I see just pale in comparison. And look just outright stupid in comparison. Um, and then I can see right through other stuff. Like, I, I see through, oh, look at this. They're going to get a fear-mongering going about cancer. And then they're going to, uh, certain assholes on the internet are going to scare people into taking poison, telling them it's a cure-all. Like, I can already see this going. It's like, it'll, it'll be the same people talking about uh, Middleton right now will be telling everyone, oh my gosh, here's a secret clastogenic product that you have to take. <laughs> I hate it so much. But there's, there's a ton of information that's not the issue, right? The, the, the issue is that we don't have enough time to go through all the information and that people don't know that it's not just all this bullshit information on TikTok and YouTube that, that should be contending for their um, attention. Okay. Um, I think we're on a good track here. We've covered a lot. This is a key uh, part of the operation, and it, it's come along a, a long a lot since I last showed it. So let me show this here. This is called Book Importer. So I can open up my library here. There it goes. So just a collection of books I have in a folder somewhere, and each of these is just a big folder full of images, one image per page. And so I can go through here and kind of check out the pages. And if I want to, I can load up the book. And so I'm already kind of seeing the, the words fly off the pages into our text to speech <laughs> and being read to us. That's the next step. I've got to visualize it. But um, here's what I'm thinking. So in addition to being able to go through all of these pages, and I, I haven't hooked this up yet, but the next step is I want to be able to resize on these and drag it around and perfect it. But the question becomes, do you want it to happen to everything with that same rule? Are you updating the rule? Or are you updating it just for the page, aka making a unique rule for each page that you adjust? 
And so I put this up at the top as an option. Drag a resize tool, modify rule. I should put modify rule or new rule for page. And then there's this pop-up column crop rules, which is a lot better now. So if I click on one of these, it, it'll show me an example page if one exists. Like this is just a single page for 77. It's a two column. And the reason it's its own page is because of all this weird gap at the top because it's the first page. And I can go through here and I can do random page for rule. I guess there's just, oh no, there we go. Or I can toggle through like next, next, next. See how it lines up? So what I want to do next is get a page where it'll take all of these slivers, all these columns that are cropped out and then puts them all stacked vertically with additional tools. Namely, I want to be able to um, crop anything off the bottom if there's something like say uh, some of this top header text creeps in. I want to have like on a for each of the columns stacked vertically, some additional uh, ways to basically crop off some pixels from the top or the bottom. But we're getting close. And then the, the question is, okay, choose the provider for uh, OCR. And the best one that I found is um, OpenAI's vision model. The quality is, with that would be so much higher, especially for especially if it's not even close for anything like um, Greek or Sanskrit. Uh, it's just a little bit pricey, but the GPT-4 vision model opens up a whole new world for getting the text from a book. And then there's cheaper alternatives too that might work for just uh, typical English stuff. But it's you know really amazing to see this all coming together. This page... <laughs> There's this uh, complexity that I, I had to work through over the weekend, but it's very satisfying. Uh, there's there's still some some weirdness. Like if I change the number of columns, I think I've got to work through some some bugs here and there. Like I think also if I add a, I don't want to go through the minor bugs. I will though. So this one, for example, the table of contractions. It's uh, its own rule just for this page. If we scroll to that rule. Up here, these are their own rules. So I think this is going to be a great way to do text to speech. And it probably won't be directly to speech from here because there's some, uh, especially for something like this, like this page right here, table of contractions does a lot of heavy lifting throughout the book. <laughs> a lot of people don't even know how to read these reference books. I was, I was pretty much illiterate to a lot of these facts. Um, just even a couple years ago, but I have enough etymology books that, and I was, you know, flipping through the pages. The, one of the great things about having physical stuff is you just have it open and perusing and find random stuff. And, um, it was like an aha light bulb moment when I saw that it, it let me see if I can open up one of these pages. Oh, I can do it through here where it had it, had it open. But it'll just say like in the book, A-S, for example, A-S. And you're like, I don't know what that means. It's very cryptic. It's like, oh, am I supposed to know what that? And a lot of times uh, when I first started, I would just skim over that. I'm like, I have no idea what, <laughs> why you're putting all this encrypted random stuff here. L you know, little did I know that there was a whole key at the front of the book. My point here though is, wouldn't it be great if there's a transformation step? You could probably do this with a chat GPT vision as part of the text to speech is notify it or maybe in secondary calls once you have the text for each of these. But say if you have one of these pages right here for each of these items, maybe even on a case by case basis, you could have it in its own page to do follow up custom work, especially if you do something a lot like transforming dictionaries, which I'll be doing a lot of. Let's see if we can find any um, examples here.
Let's go to a different page. Like, for example, right here, O-N, back. Lith, pekala. This is for the etymological definition of the word back. But I know that's Old Norse, because I've looked at a lot of these uh, types of dictionaries. Old Norse, but if you don't know that, and you just see O-N, O-N, and this gets back to the um, conservation of pages that had to go into making these books. So if we go to O-N, let's go to 78. Didn't work. O-N is Old Norse Icelandic. So I think that would be better to put spelled out since space is not an issue anymore, especially when we're doing text-to-speech. You don't want to just say O-N. <laughs> so uh, things like that. There's transformation steps, and you'd have to decide, do you want to really have a text-to-speech version of this book? I, I think I do, personally. But then again, um, there's the other goals in, in mind as well, which is, for me, I want to have, and I'll distribute this to others as well, I want to have a way, if I'm researching the word back, or any of these words, let's find an example here. Pencil. If I'm researching, oh, that has, let's pick a different word. Um, coerce. You know, if I'm doing a, a, a research project and I really want to understand the word coerce, I want to have it so I can see all the different definitions and see which dictionaries they're coming from, what the year is, what, you know, if this is an etymology dictionary, what, um, you know, who's the author, what the year it was published, etc. And to see them all open, I think, would be fascinating. And so that's that's one of my goals as well. So that would involve understanding these documents to a more granular level and actually getting this into the database with the word and the definition versus just a big blob of text. But that's going to differ from what we're studying to what we're studying. This is kind of a, a weird example for me to use here. Because there's also a lot of like historical documents that we want to import and process and have uh, reported back to us. That's key. So um, there's a lot of tools and a lot of possibilities. No shortage of tools. <laughs> I do feel like there's a shortage of time. That's one of our biggest enemies. So we don't have much time. So um, I think we need to press forward and continue building, continue sharing. That's one of the key takeaways from the gossip protocol, which I keep talking about, is the number of people that each person talks to and shares information with is what dictates how fast information and whether or not information transmits entirely through a system, through a, a network. So we need to build communication channels, keep them open. And um, what's kind of interesting is the idea that these long dead authors and researchers from bygone eras are still nodes in the, <laughs> the human information graph. And I think there are people trying to burn these, these old books and keep them out of people's hands, arresting people who are doing shadow libraries and such. And um, that's a great way to keep truth alive if there's truth in these books, which I found there to be a great amount. Uh, I think it was very competitive back in the day, and that was the medium by which people would package up information. It was also, of course, a propaganda distribution method used for evil in a lot of cases, and people would also just get things wrong and be uh, full of hubris and 
certainty and be just totally off base, delusional. So uh, it, it's it's a very interesting problem. But I hope everybody's uh, delving through the old books that are now available to us and just seeing the wealth of inf- of information. And uh, then there's also, of, of course, all the modern stuff, all the issues that we're confronted with that we're trying to solve. And uh, I'm not putting down anybody else's solution. This is just kind of separate to it. I think we need to be fully engaged in the information war. And one of the key tactics of the information war is they try to keep people ignorant and uh, devoid of information like a plant that's been pulled out of the soil. You know, it's roots. It's been er eradicated. Um, So trying to think what else I, I, there, there's a lot more uh, we, we talked in the prior streams about the possibility of using this to generate code and to build systems this is one of the ways that I'm trying to apply what we talked about there how do we build code and how do we build productivity systems and what do we apply it towards and my, my mission has been the same more or less for a long time with a big shift a few uh, for a few years there towards medical freedom and no no forced or misleading poisons being pushed on people, which is still a problem. But it's always been a pursuit of truth. I want to find the truth. And I feel like a lot of people, myself included, are really ignorant on a lot of the discoveries and a lot of the things that come before us. And um, leaves us in a bad place to trying to figure anything out if we don't have a foundation. But there is a wealth of information and a wholly new way for us to process it, which I find to be very, very intriguing. So I don't want to ramble on too long. Let me see if there's anything in the chat. Shout out to everybody who stopped by in the chat. Trying to think what else. Um, just encouraging people to keep searching, keep building. I'm hoping to bring a lot more to the table, so get ready for uh, big document dumps. That's something I want to bring in the future. Just boom, here's a thousand uh, documents about etymology for the enthusiasts out there. Here's a huge set of documents about history that are just fascinating documents. I don't know about the truthfulness of all of them. But then from there, it's like, okay, how do we whittle this down? Because I can already see the problems that come up after that. The problems that come up after that is, oh my gosh, this is so much information. How do we make sense of this? How do we um, save ourselves? How, how can we multitask? Because a lot of us are looking for information to consume auditorily. Is that a word? Uh, a lot of us are looking for information to consume and to learn and to get better and to understand our reality and to excel. Um, and we have to work during the day maybe or we have different pursuits that we're chasing after. And so uh, we're looking at something. We can't be, you know, our face in a book all day. But if we can automate this stuff, or if some of us can automate this, and we can turn it into audio files, if it's fascinating material and it's better than any video out there, I, I think obviously we're, we're going to want to listen to it. If it's bullshit and it's like, oh, this is crap, <laughs> then we're not. So um, it'll be interesting to see what we dig up It's, uh, I think people underestimate how much obfuscation there is, which is interesting too, because that's what they say that, uh, happened in the Tower of Babel story. They say that the, the payback for the evil humans was that their, their plan of using language as a technology was thwarted when, uh, God said, but when basically God confused everybody and stopped their ability to use language as they intended. Um, and who are the people? That, well, I, I just see people playing God and using that kind of story as justification to do the same. 
as if like, well, of course God doesn't want anybody to have knowledge when really they're just being selfish bastards trying to prevent us from seeing the big picture. Because what is the big picture? That they have no legitimacy, that they're a figment of their own imaginations. Their, their authority is a figment of their imagination, which they project on all of us. Um, and I'm talking about the misleaders, the sellout politicians, the puppets on the stage. So I just hope people keep digging. Uh, I, I don't know. I've been kind of uh, nose to the grindstone buried in, in this stuff, trying to get this uh, perfected because I'm just so inspired at the moment, finding all these lost uh, documents and books. And I'm just, I don't know. Maybe everyone's doing like really interesting stuff. All these other video creators, I don't even really tune into to many people these days. But um, it just feels like a shame. Like I feel like we should be doing so much more with all these tools. And uh, I plan to, to do my part and maybe try to lead by example. Although my through my output's been low recently, so I've got to get more to you all. But behind the scenes, it's been uh, very productive, and it's just a matter of how do I package this up as far as the systems that I'm building and, and as far as the, the fruit of those labors, which is um, trying to tap in to the, into archive this wealth of human research. And I think that we're going to be facing attack on that front. I think we're in the honeymoon phase of chat GPT when they're trying to woo everybody and to get everybody to the party before they scare everybody away after they've barricaded the exit doors. <laughs> so, um, we should be planning, not don't, don't plan according to the illusion that everything's hunky dory for a long time. It's not going to be the case plan for the opposite of that. And, um, hope for the best, I guess. I don't know what to hope for. I think we just need to be realistic and rational. And the last thing I want to see is more book burning. We know that the establishment doesn't care about information. Did you see what they did with YouTube? They, um, in front of everybody, they burned so many books. You go back to playlists on YouTube and it's, oh, this has been deleted. This channel is now terminated. This broke the community guideline rules. And then all, you know, a lot of other stuff was just deleted because people were on like two strikes. They had to save their channel. The establishment does not care about giving us information. They're locking people up for these types of archival efforts. It's totally Fahrenheit 451, which is the quote on the left. Why I'm bringing up. Because it's not, it, we're not living in a tower of Babel. It's nothing of the sort. There's certain people who are making the follies that that story warns against, which is playing God and, um, trying to reach the status of a God or trying to reach the heavens when we're mortal flesh and blood, you know, people getting, you know, caught up in their own delusions of grandeur, power, uh, lust. So I, I think those are real issues, but we are not <laughs> an informed species. And I think if we become more informed and use it for good, that's only a step in the right direction. So I'll leave it there. Thank you, everybody. And uh, if you want to support the show, check out the website. There's going to be more websites to come, but groupdiscover.com is the website. Link in the description. Take care.